I don't know about you guys, but I can remember where I was when I first saw an Eldrazi. I'd taken a break from playing Magic while starting at university, also known as college to our American cousins, just after World Break had released. The reason being that I just didn't have enough cash as a poor student to keep up with the game. This shit's expensive. I met up with an old friend and we were on our way to a standard event around the time after New Frexia released. A whole block later, he was lending me a deck. I think it was black, white tokens. I remember being a wet morning, we were driving to Southampton, rain was patting on the windscreen, and the only new magic cards that I could recall having seen at this point were some boosters I had bought on a whim from a Waterstones on holiday in Isle of Wight with my now wife. You see, this is way before we really kept up to date with magic via the mothership, Reddit, or anything similar. So I asked my friend, what's happened at the end of the Zendikar block then? What's happened in the story? He smiles wryly and says, do you remember those mysterious floating hedrons? I confirm with a nod, and he says, well, they were full of Eldrazi. Now, I'd vaguely heard the term because a couple of cards in World Wake Group had mentioned them already, namely I Ugin. But we, at the time of World Wake's release, had no idea actually what Eldrazi were going to be. It wasn't even confirmed at the time that they were a creature type. It could have been a new permanent for we knew. I meekly ask him, but what the fuck is an Eldrazi? Well, Ember calls a 15-15 flying creature with protection from coloured spells. When you cast her, you take an extra turn, and when you attack with her, the defending player has to sacrifice six permanents. Uh... What? I remember thinking he was joking, until he showed me an image. I can't remember if it was from his fold from his bag or on his smartphone, but I just remember thinking, you're having a fucking laugh, right? No. This is magic now. Ultimately, the huge, ridiculous Eldrazi Titans were exciting and suitably silly. Cosalette was the first magic card I ever bought for more than £5 as a single. Now that is a slippery slope, I don't invite you all to fall down. Help me! Help me! Fast forward six and a half years from the release of Rise of the Eldrazi and we've been and gone to the return of Zendikar. I was hoped to see a post-apocalyptic set where the surviving Zendikari people live in the shadows of a cataclysmic events and the rise of the three titans. But nope, we got a very dull war narrative in which the Wizards of the Coast forgot that Soul Land due to unfair magic and they put an efficient smaller Eldrazi like Mimic to space a thought not seeing reality smasher without testing them alongside Temple and Eye of Ugin. They fucking broke modern. During that period, I travelled to GP Bologna, the first GP I ever tested heavily for. I played a lot of modern going into that tournament, so I'm really sad that my results were so fucking bad. Eldrazi Winter was insane. Every deck, excluding Infinity, was skewed heavily to deal with the new menace. The top eight was filled with five different varieties of Eldrazi decks. The winner, Kea Patel, was also piling an Eldrazi deck. Then I was banned and normality was kind of restored. However, in spite of one of the most broken neighbors being banned, the Eldrazi cards are good enough to still find a place in Eldrazi Tron list, ban Eldrazi and black white Eldrazi in taxes. Seemingly every man and his dog keeps asking me to play it, so here we are. I am doing it. This is a competitive league with Eldrazi and taxes. Don't say I never get you anything, you ungrateful fucks. The Eldrazi variant Death and Taxes looks to play a stronger tempo game than that of the Mono White or Green variant, but doesn't grind quite as well. The game plan is to deploy disruption into disruption and win before our opponents can recover. It plays a typical assortment of Vile, Catches, Estalia, and Ghost Quarter to act as Strip Mine. However, it combines this with hand disruption of Tide Hollow Skull and Thought Knots here just to disrupt our opponents on a whole different axis. Strangler and Push provide us with more removal, making the deck a stronger mid range contender in some matchups, whilst the fun of Gonti is some sweet tech, but I'm unsure of how competitive the Lord of Luxury actually is. Also, what kind of a name is that? He looks like a fucking executioner. I thought that railing in front of him there was a bloody axe until I looked a bit closer. He looks like a Marvel villain from like a Thor movie, but he's over here banging bitches and boys and mass orgies and eating grapes and shit because he's oh so luxurious. What a mad lad. As always, a huge shout out to my sponsors over at MTO Traders for helping me to put this content out, lending me cards, and supporting the channel with its growth. If you want to get a discount over on there and buying your MTO cards, you need to use the code GG get wrecked for 8% off, and that helps to support the channel also. And don't forget, my beloved patrons too, help me to keep pumping out this style of content, shouting out boners and playing death and taxes and shitty decks like bees. You are the real MVPs. If you want to support me, there'll be a link to Patreon in the description below. You need to become a patron, you can hang out with us on the Discord servers and get involved with brewing some new ideas for the channel. Now, before someone in the comments complains that I talk too much prior to gameplay, here's the fucking gameplay, so buckle up, kids. This is Eldrazi time, you motherfuckers. We keep a respectable one lander with removal, vile, and three key two drops. Life is good. Our opponent leads a tapped colonnade. Control, eh? We top deck an untapped black source, which is great for us here. We take a look at what he's working with, thanks to Sculler. Sculler is the most polarizing card in the whole deck, in my opinion. He can lead to you getting brutally blown out, much like Quella can, if you stumble after deploying him. But he's a zombie on a boat, which is a truly unique thing in all of magic, so he's got that going for him, I guess. Fuck, man, I'm on a boat, motherfucker! 
We take the path, otherwise Scholar will get wrecked next turn. We can use Vile to play around as in-hand Quella now that we know about it. Our opponent plays a fetch land and I get excited, however, he knows what our deck does and cracks his fetch in response to our Vile trigger. The Jesus ain't schooling fools on this day, friends. I decided to deploy an Arbiter to make him play more carefully with his mana. I decided not to show my whole hand by keeping Thalia in the Vile, unsure if this was correct in hindsight. On his turn, our Scholar gets pathed and we can't search due to Jesus. Now he has another path in hand. Brilliant. As I said, Scala feels bad if your opponent draws the relevant removal, which is every removal spell in modern short of gut shot, so yeah, he's a bit shit. We decided to deploy Thalia in our turn in response to the Vile Trigger to play around getting path with no mana available to play through the Jesus' ability. We get in for two. In end step, he paths us for two mana and we pay and search up our only other basic land. He plays the Geist of St. Traft, known for slapping you upside the aft. Aft. I, is that the slang for the head? No? Okay. We draw another land, weak source. We play our second vial and swing for two. On his turn he slams in with Geist and we ambush him with our Strangler and take four damage on the chin from the accompanying Angel. Geist does die in combat however so we feel good about this, like a warm sunset on a summer's day. Fuck you Geist! We untap and draw yet another land, good, good, let the flood and hate flow through your veins. We decide not to attack into an ambush ghost and pass turn. He sticks his Quella in end step and we plan to let him hit us a bit as our push deals with the colonnade when activated. We draw another push which isn't so bad here. We get in for two, nickel and dime, lemons and lime. He appears to be flooding out although the fear of a single Sphinx's regular tempo list means his land drops might be of higher value than ours. He dimes us. We draw a wisp, an old friend here to wreck bitches and we get in for a nickel. He dimes us back. We draw Blade Spicer, which combined with Wisp makes for a strong game plan moving forward. We dime him, and then he nickel backs us in the end step with Electrolyze, which makes the race very, very real. He then plays another Queller. We are no longer the Tortoise in this Tortoise and Hair analogy. He goes to combat and swings at both creatures, signaling that he must have a Bolt or Helix in hand to finish me off, considering my life total. I violate the Splicer, and then violate a Wisp plan to flicker my Splicer to enable Revolt with a double push in hand. A Braid kills our Splicer in response, which is sad. We push one of the Quellers and live life dangerously, taking two. This is so we can push the colonnade he tries to block with next turn and kill him. We draw a Displacer, which means the mana available in the Violon 3, the rules of magic no longer apply to us. I decide that we only need to deploy this if a path off of the colonnade in response to our push. He does not. Winner, winner, elemental flickering moth beast dinner. Another one. Another one. In sideboarding, we ditch a lot of scholars as they seem balanced, removal heavy tempo lists look like this. We also cut a push and bring in every card that gains us life. Here we have Rift Watcher, which most people don't actually really play, and I think people should. He has even more utility than Finks in some matchups, as he's able to block a 2 3 fly in the air without dying and block two ones on the ground in terms of snack caster mages. He comes to block Blink Moth Nexus and Ink Moth Nexus in other matchups as well. If we flick this guy, we gain life when he enters and when he leaves. One activation of displays a target in this guy will net us full life on resolution. In Rift Watcher, we trust. We we keep a two lander full of cyborg tech, we need one lander off the top or a vial in the next two draws and we are golden. Our opponent leads with a tap land into turn two not so spunky visions. We untap and draw Jesus and play him and Jesus eats and electrolyze. Rest in peace my sweet prince. We draw the third land and cast a resilient threat in the form of Finks. Our opponent makes a fourth land drop but casts nothing. I can smell a quella from a mile off. It smells of like burnt hair and mahogany. It's a trap! I decide to run a 3 drop out to see what he has. Eldrazi displays it eats a helix. Opponent casts Mum and Pop's one stop Fopter Shop, which seems very, very good here actually. We swing for three and no blocks. We path Mum and Pop's and cast a freshly drawn turn five Aether Vile. It isn't the Aether Vile we wanted, but perhaps it's the one that we deserve. We get hit for two in the air for some Thopters and Finks bites the path shaped bullet in upkeep. We slam a Golem Daddy and have him bolted, leaving behind his orphaned Golem Son. Our opponent takes this chance whilst we're tapped out to get in for six with his Colonnade and Thopters. We draw Shock, play it tapped and takes opportunity whilst he is almost tapped out to swing with a shambling vent and a golem. He then dimes us but keeps all mana open. We swing with golem and then deploy an Aven Rift Watcher. All this life gains means we are certainly winning this race at present. He swings openly into Aven, we block one, take one and then we see a verdict from him. We make a land drop, go into the red zone and get helixed. We then deploy our feels bad post combat Thalia. He plays engine explosives on one to catch our vial. We make a wasteland struggle in response in order to speed up the clock. 
it gets bolted. We draw a vial, play it, and we hit him for two. He main phase shoots our Thalia and our face and electrolyzes. The grind is fucking real. We draw more removal and less threats. He end steps Aquila and we miss the opportunity to kill it whilst he is tapped out. Fucking hell, that's bad. We path it in his turn in response to not so juicy visions in case it sets him up with counter magic. The Aquila is dead. He braids our vial, we play a land. He does nothing. We play a cavern of souls. He plays a second colonnade and does nothing else. We play a cat, Jesus and he gets bolted. One like equal one prayer. A naked picture of a girl would get a thousand likes, so how many can our handsome cat boy get? Conley gets up in our grill, so we ghost quarter out of the sky. Pew pew! We draw a TKS and cast it off the cavern, find our opponent packing two counter spells. We exile the dust till dawn, because that's not the best card he's got right now. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Too much chocolate. He uses cryptid to end step bounce our dude, which means he draws two cards. He makes a land and swings with Conlade and gets it pushed. Doesn't use logic not here for some reason to protect it, but that's beyond me. He then taps out for a second and pops one stop thought shop. We cast TKS again, exile his cause return. This is better in order to resolve threats and have them stick later on the line if we draw some of our smaller guys. He attacks with both doctors and we go to 12. We hit another land drop and activate our second Chambler and go to beat down. He uses mum and pop body plus an activation to kill TKS. And then he gets in for one. We attempt to get into for two with life link again, but Snappy Helix deals with our land. We play a displacer after combat and he has that bolted too. Lame. We get hit for three. We resolve another Thought Knots here and take the Lodge Knot in his hand, leaving wear tear. He gets in with another Thopped out and we draw another land. He takes four and goes to one. Next turn he keeps both blockers back and uses Helix plus Snappy Block to kill our Thought Knots here. The big swing from our opponent with a man land flashed in Quarrel and Thopter. We ghost caught the land and attempt to cast Bless the Lines with two modes to gain life and sack one with attackers to stem the bleeding but it gets cryptic countered. I feel like a corner may have been turned at this point. We draw a wisp which allows us to exile the token and provide a block against his 2-3. However snap cast it into electrolyze in main phase deals with our wisp and shoots us in the face. We draw another wisp and get pathed on sight. Looks like we aren't going to win the top deck war against a blue white deck with actual card draw and to a lesser extent selection. On to game 3. We lead with a turn 2 Thalia and fail to hit a third land drop. A turn 3 bolt from my opponent prompts me to path my own Thalia in response in order to ensure I can hit a land drop and play creatures on curve. I untap and slam Displacer into play. Displacer. I untap and slam Displacer. I untap and. I untap and slam Splicer into play, and the Splicer eats an Electrolyze, and we get to beat him for three. I cast Gonti, Lord of Luxury, Master of Bath Soaps, Overseer of Novelty Bath Bombs, and Exile a Cryptic Command. This means we get to cast a Cryptic Command with any colour of mana at any point ongoing, even if Gonti dies. Yeah, that seems pretty good. A main phase bolt kills our golem. We try to stick a Finx to push the clock harder after striking in with Gonti, but Aquella catches him. Our opponent casts a Seaman Stains and hits us for two. I play badly, deciding to path our opponent's Aquella main phase one instead of holding up Cryptic to protect Gonti on the swing. Whilst this is happening, our opponent Helix is Gonti, and we feel very, very bad about this. We hit for no damage this turn, as I am bad at magic. Our Finx resolves, and I slam a Displacer into play. Our opponent casts Dusk, Wrath our board and a snappy bolt cleans up the second half of the Finks. I draw a vial and play it alongside displacer number two who gets killed by a lightning helix of course because he always has the removal. He hits us for two. We cast a third displacer and pass back for him to main phase snappy helix our displacer away. We play shambling vent tapped and use cryptic command to counter and set quella and draw a card. We get smashed for eight from a colonnade and two snappies. We draw a wisp and decide to get in for some lifelink with the shambling vent. He tries for the big swing again but we path this colonnade this time round. He decides not to swing into an open vial so I end step and make a displacer. I swing the displacer and he double blocks. I use Wasteland Strangler to kill one off of the vial and get a profitable block in killing the other Snapcaster Mage. He verdicts again and then brings his snappies back to hand with Dawn. He has a minute left on his clock to win this game. We attack with Vents again. He does nothing and passes back. We slam Thoughtlots here and get quelled by our opponent. He then ends up Snappy Helix as our face. We derp again and activate Vial prior to combat instead of after attacks. We flick it out his Queller, get to cast our TKS. With TKS trigger on the stack, our opponent casts a Snapcaster Mage to flashback Electrolyze, killing our Wisp, and then we get to exile the other Electrolyzers in his hand. Yes, this match is complicated. We draw yet another land, because we are good at drawing lands in this game when they don't matter, but not earlier on when they do. And we activate Shaman events, and what does our opponent times out? GG time E. I do think I probably could have won that game if I played a little bit tighter. There's a couple of just sequencing errors that gave me too much information or allowed him to get back into the game. Another one. Another one. Another one.
Our opponent leads Eldrazi Temple into Relic of Progenitus, which means we are up against Eldrazi Tron. What kind of a prick plays Eldrazi? We lead Swamp into Vile, and our opponent makes a turn two Matter Reshaper. We play Thalia and pass back. A Machine Gun Bastard for one kills Thalia off, and we get hit for three. We untap, play a Ghost Quarter, play a Thalia, Violin Cat Jesus, and strip mine our opponent's Eldrazi Temple. Praise the Lord! I'm trying to do the sort of like, you know, like the fucking like puritanical preacher from like Southern States of America style thing, like Praise the Lord! By the way, I don't know if you guys have heard, but a chain of bakers in the UK called Greg's had to publicly apologise for posting a picture of which a nativity scene had the baby Jesus replaced with a sausage roll. The reason they did this was that sausage rolls are one of the most popular products. Personally, I thought it was a great bit of humorous advertising and don't mind one bit, but others had described it as a sick anti-Christian humour. Sounds like someone needs to chill the fuck out and eat a nice, hot, moist sausage roll. Mmm, yeah. I need to stop drinking tea before recording. Fuck. Our opponent misses a land drop. We attack him with Thala, he blocks his matter reshaper and doesn't find a land off of its trigger, revealing TKS instead and draws it to hand. Our opponent hits a third land, the second piece of his Tron set up. He isn't tapping out though, so we can't strip mine him again. I just have to take a look at his hand with my own TKS. We see a plethora of threats, most of which are super scary if he hits a land off the top. If it's a Tron landing for the Khan, if there's any landing for the TKSs. I'll take one of the Thought Not Seers as I don't think I can beat both of them in a row with this current hand. He plays one of the Thought Not Seers and takes our removal. We draw Skull and take the matter shape out of his hand as it's a threat that he can actually play right now. We then strip mine as Urza's tower, taking him further off Tron. We trade our TKS for his TKS and each draw a card. Frustratingly, I drew a Wasteland Strangler that would have been great in this scenario to stop it from being a trade and to be up on my side, but just one card too late. He does nothing for his turn. We untap and swing for six. Skuller gets killed by a spatial contortion, giving him his shaper back to hand. He hits a fourth land drop and plays the shaper. We kill it in end step with Strangler off the vial. We get in for seven and he concedes under the pressure. Another one. Our opponent leads mine into map and we play nothing on turn one and slam a Skuller on turn two. Playing the Arbiter isn't worth it as he just cracks the map in response. Our best bet here is to try and take the payoff and then cat Jesus plus strip mine him next turn. We see a Smasher, TKS, TKS. We take a TKS here in the hope that he smashes next turn allowing us to then resolve cat Jesus and go for the strip man plan. He goes and finds the missing Tron land in the end step with his map. Thorn Lord Seer comes down and rips away our Gonti. That feels like a mistake. Mistake, unless he has drawn spatial contortion, which I think he has. We draw path, so I let to keep up path alongside my arbiter. In hindsight, I'm not sure if I like this line. I got the way that he did our spatial contortion, but he cast it in his turn when his Tron lands are on line. We pull off this TKS in response, trigger, and draw a temple. We then get smashed. We draw another cat Jesus because all good religious icons come in multiples. I mean, just look at the Spice Girls. I decide to go all in on taking them off Tron and or a second smash over top with my Ghost Quarters in order to maximise my chances of surviving. We smash in for four and then reset our Skuller with the Fickerist to look at his hand. We see a Worm Callie Count cast unless he top decks the needed tower, so we take the TKF that's in his hand again. The way we are messing with his lands means that even if he group blocked down his Reality Smasher here, which we need to do to not die, it puts him a long way off from casting TKS without hitting runner runner land drops. He doesn't draw the lands he needs and we don't block and kill the smasher and go to one life. Squeaky bomb territory, five pence piece. My arsehole was as tight as a nun's cunt. We get in for two and don't play a Thalia. I don't really understand why. I think I F6 when I shouldn't have. Yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm just not very good at this game. We deploy a Thalia next turn and then the following turn, a Thought Not Seer. We exile his Thought Not Seer because him being able to play run over on a TK off the top of the deck is what gets him back in this game. He plays a reshape up. I punt again by not swinging for Leaf One and forcing him to have to block the TKS. I keep my R back for no reason because he couldn't block it even if he wanted to so in reality I should have put him to two here which gives us more outs from stuff he could draw for top of his deck. The death of Matt Reshaper hits another land and he plays Thought Not Seer, says GG in the chat and scoops it up. Cat Jesus saves the day. Round three. In round three, our opponent leads into Aether Vile for planes. It's either a version of different taxes, potentially allies, or more likely humans. And of course it's humans. He plays champion into champion and we make a late turn three start with Blade Spicer, but he is the best card we have in this matchup, so I'm cool with it. He sticks a free booter and gets nothing because our hands are full of creatures and then plays a Mantis Rider, which is probably his best card in this matchup too. He swings for seven and I let it through because I need to flicker the Spicer to have a chance of winning this. I whistle my own Spicer and get ready for some blocks next turn. He plays a Thales attempt and I can't really block this Mantis Rider here, so I just take six. I untap and play a Displacer and a Temple and thus have enough mana to do almost anything I want because Displacer doesn't give a fuck about your rules. He swings in the air and I block one. I flicker the other out into end step by activating Displacer and target my own Flicker Wisp. He concedes because he isn't keen to go through this rodeo. Displacer is the best card EU. Another one. 
another win. Game two, I'm looking at a wonky hand into an okay one lander. That's right, boys and girls, it's time. In Vile we trust. We scry out early temple to the top of our library, he leads with Noble Hierarch, we play a Vile. He plays Champion into Freebooter and takes our Fatal Push. We play a Thought Not on turn 2 off of 2 temples and exile Thali from his hand. He plays a Hierarch and gets in for 5. We slam a Golem Daddy and get very close to Viling in Displacer with activations available. My penis begins to harden. He plays a Mantis Rider and my penis softens again. He swings for a whole bunch and we throw a Golem under the Champion's shaped bus to soften the blow. We draw Thalia and pass back. Our plan is to play Displacer, flicker the pirate and push the champion and then I just tap my mana wrong and don't realise until it's too late. I even tell them this in the chat. Whoops. We go to one life again. He untaps, sees that we have two Displacer activations every turn and concedes. He respects the Displacer. I keep a double vial hand reluctantly and then we draw the third vial. Fuck. My. Life. They are humans again. The deck really is flavor of the month. He leads Vile into Thalia. We lead Vile into Vile. Meddling Mage names Thought Not Seal, which is fair enough. I slam a splice as I draw my third land. He Viles in Meddling Mage, naming Path to Exile. He swings madly into my lines and Viles in a Mare of Brook, but my splicer makes quick work of the Meddling Mage in front of it due to the first strike. Path is back online. I draw a Wasteland Strangler, we path his mare, and then Violin the Strangler, and use the Path Mail as food to strangle the Thalia after combat. He has seen enough, and he concedes. A quick aside, has anyone noticed how similar Flicker Wisp and Wasteland Strangler actually are visually? Like the two sides of the same multi-dimensional spacefaring coin. One is sharp and jagged in its tentacly beauty, angular, chiseled, handsome. The other one slick and tubular, curving tentacles like a sexy bowl of space monster spaghetti. They are brothers from a differing interplanar traveling mothers, Ying to a Yang, Starsky and Hutch, Jaffa and Cake. The real question being, which one is actually the cake? In game two, we keep a hand with our best cards in this matchup and can't complain. He has no turn one play, which makes me think his hand is either complete garbage, or he's kept it on the strength of Cybertech, but it's still garbage. We leave with a vial, and our opponent fails to make a second land drop. Twice. He eventually plays a champion, but we are miles ahead now with an onboard splicer and a vial on three. We thought not see him on turn four and see a hand full of two drops. Whilst I can see these cards are good and one land kind of unlocked his hand to an extent, a one lander without a one drop in an aggro deck just seems bad through and through and he should not have kept this. We win a short while later, our opponents only cast two spells all game and one of those got strangled by a wasteland strangler. In spite of a few bits of loose play, the 5-0 dream is still alive. Let's see if we can make it. Them doors that was closed, I ripped the doors off and took the hinges off. And when I took the hinges off, I put the hinges in the boy's hands. Yeah, in the boy's hands. You know, I, I took the whole door off and the hinges and I put it in the boy's hands. You could put the hinges on the hands too. Never give up, never surrender. Another one. Another one. Another one. Another one. Another one. And another one. And another one. We look into five in round five on the play because magic hates us. And keep a hand with two lands as a cat Jesus. We draw the vial two turns too late as we find out our opponent on scapeshift from a turn one suspended search for tomorrow. So we don't have time to deploy the vial as we have to disrupt an ASAP through cat Jesus. Perhaps I'm tilted by the mulligan but I get a little bit greedy here and try to blow up my opponent with a ghost court on turn three with only one mana up. A fetch and play and a search ready to be cast next turn. If he doesn't have the bolt here we could pretty much win the game on the spot because he can't crack the fetch and he can't actually search off the search for tomorrow but he has the bolt my greed is punished fatality i could have kept it up until we had tried to bolt but i'm left feeling very very sore we are so far behind now i doubt we can recover he ramps ramps prismatic omen primeval titan gg well played on to game two. And another one. I keep a super unexciting hand off the virtue of selfless spirit against Wraths. In hindsight, this hand is pretty dire and I probably should have kept it. He ramps through my super late Thalia and I draw an Arbiter three turns too late. I slam the Jesus and Ghost Quarter him off two lands and pray does another sweeper next turn to give us a game of magic. Nope. There it is. Hello darkness, my old friend. 
I play a selfless spirit, but he plays a primeval titan, which is which is quite a bit better than selfless spirit at this point in the game. He fetches two valicates, and I just fucking concede. I could have played that quite a lot tighter, I think, if I just mulliganed a bit better. Uh, but that's magic for you. So 4-1 is a respectable first time league with the deck. It's obviously a strong variant of the Death and Taxes archetype and I think any Taxes player should have access to it, especially in a combo centric meta game because the hand disruption is so good at stopping combo decks, excluding Titan Shift. I enjoyed the list I played, Verdict is still out on Gonti and I think Skuller could be better. Um, the other cards you can play in its slot are all dependent upon meta games. That could be more splices against go wide strategies, bobs to grind its mid range. There are any numbers of ways you can customize this deck. I just think Tide Hollow Skuller is just a bit too much of a blowout card and pulls the deck in two different directions that I don't like. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to let me know, like the video, drop me a comment with your thoughts on the video or the deck, and don't forget to subscribe. We are so fucking close to the 10k mark with this channel now. Less than 150 subs to go at time of recording. So make sure you share this video with all your modern loving friends if you want to support the channel directly then there's a link to patreon coming up on screen shortly in the meantime don't forget if in doubt flick it out i've been pleasant kenobi and i'll see you all very 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 soon